Is your homebrew unstable? Find out on today's CSB Unpasteurized. So we're going to talk about stabilization today. And this comes up all the time. We get questions a lot. People say, well, how long can I leave it on the shelf? Or how do you store it? Or all these other things. So let's let's start off. We have some note cards here to uh, keep everything straight. And we both have beverages as well. It's been a day already, so yeah, it, it's um, it's five to twelve. Okay, <laughs> it's it's been a day already. What are you drinking? I'm drinking a uh, cocktail of my own creation. This is actually our strawberry wine with seltzer water and Pims. If you are unfamiliar with Pims, it is this beautiful creation. Thank you, UK people, for bringing up Pims into our life. Uh, <laughs> I honestly don't know what's in it. They're really secretive. Nobody like, wants to tell nobody you. Nobody wants to in tell it. you what's in Pims. But it is stable. <laughs> it is stable. Yeah. I, however, am not. Oh. Depends on the day. <laughs> um, I am actually having our coffee mill. This is uh I don't know how old it is now, but this is our coffee mill. It's good. I can check. Oh, it's from May of this year. This is only a couple months old. Yeah, this is the new cup. Yeah, well, how do you know? I don't know unless I look. We also have to remember not to flomp on the table. Right, because otherwise you hear this. See? And you don't really don't want to hear that. You don't need that in your head. So we apologize. Right. So what is stabilization? And when we talk about stabilization in brews, what we mean is that it will not continue fermentation. Okay, that's what stable really means. It also just means that it won't change much, meaning like you're not expecting any infections, you're not expecting anything to alter it in such a way as to become a negative experience for the consumer. Now, different brews have different ways and means to create what they deem to be stabilization. For example, commercially made wines tend to push the pH level yeah. because that aids in their particular beverage yeah, stabilization. Yeah, they, they add acidity, so they lower the pH. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, that's one way to do it. Another way is chemical stabilization, and then there's pasteurization, and there's there's all sorts of things. We'll get into all that in a little bit. But when is it needed? Well, it is needed to stabilize whenever there's a chance that it could referment. In other words, if you have something that went completely dry and say it went to 10%, but you know you used a 15% alcohol tolerance yeast, and then you added sweetener to it, there's a chance that that could re-ferment. So you would want to stabilize that in some way. Now, the other option is you can just let it keep going and keep on step feeding it until it surpasses the alcohol tolerance of your yeast. That is also stabilizing. It's just a different way of doing it. You can also let it go completely dry and not add any additional fermentable sugars, and therefore it's stable as well. You can also let it go completely dry, and instead of adding fermentable sugars, add non-fermentable sugars, and then it's stable. She just answered the next question. When is it not needed? That was it right there. You don't need it if there's no chance of fermentation. In other words, when something went dry, like she said, or non-fermentable sugars. Now, one of the things that I want to point out at this juncture is when you have a stall. And Would it be prudent? By that, <laughs> I mean when you have enough fermentable sugar still left in your brew and you haven't reached the yeast tolerance of your particular, the alcohol tolerance of your particular yeast, but it stopped and you let it wait a week and you checked it again and it stayed at that same gravity reading. It is stalled. Now, lots of times we don't know why. The, yeah. The yeast may have just said, nope, I'm done. I'm well, there's it usually an, an underlying Sometimes reason. Sometimes there's a pH issue. There, there's many issues that could cause right. a stall. But even if you wait that week, week's uh, distance and take the reading and they're the same, as we recommend in all of our videos, take readings, people. That's my PSA of the day. Uh, <laughs> Isn't this whole thing a PSA? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, you don't know when the environment may change at some point down the line right. that will cause that stall to go, hey, we're good now. Let's get back to re-fermenting. So even if you feel like it's stable because of a stall, it still isn't technically stable. Right. That's, that's a really important thing to understand. Um, in the past, we were guilty of that, too. We bottled things that were stalled, and they seemed stable. Now, thankfully, we've never had a problem. 
as a result of that, but others have. And here's why. Let's say you were fermenting something and it was wintertime. So you kept your house a little cooler because, you know, heat is expensive to keep up. So you fermented it at a low temperature and it stalls at, say, let's say 1.030. But it's only like 10% alcohol and you know you used a 15% yeast. You think, okay, it's good. It stayed at 1.030 for a couple of weeks. I'm fine. I can bottle this, which in theory sounds great because it seems stable. However, you bottle that, then springtime comes and your house warms up a bit. Well, what if the yeast decided it was just too cold for us to finish this before, but now it's not? That's the thing. Yeast are microscopic creatures and they don't actually completely get removed by racking. There's still some in there and they could rebuild a colony over time and they could restart fermentation. And if that was to occur, you get boom, not a good thing to have. And that's just one way that it could happen. Any number of things over the time of aging could fall into just the right place to make the yeast go, hey, this is a favorable environment for fermentation again. All it takes is a few points of gravity to overpressurize and cause an explosion, depending on the brew, depending on the bottle you put it in, especially if you weren't expecting to have to worry about pressure. So you put it in a regular wine bottle that doesn't hold pressure. A few PSI of pressure is enough to make them explode. So you got to be really, really careful. The only time that we would not stabilize intentionally is if something went completely dry or it went completely dry and we used non-fermentable sugars to sweeten. That's the only time. Other than that, you definitely want to stabilize in some way. Now, what we're referring to with stabilization, because we, we briefly talked about the pH adjustment in wine, that is a long-term storage thing of, of keeping the integrity of that particular wine strain as similar as possible. What we're actually talking about here is halting fermentation. Is or stop preventing. aging fermentation. Yeah. And so this can be done chemically by stopping their ability to consume sugars and stopping their ability to reproduce. That requires two so that separate chemicals. Two chemicals that you need to do the double whammy there. And I'm not using the word chemical as an evil word. No. Um, we don't particularly like to use the preservatives that are necessary to do this. That's why we don't do it. So we're just going to mention that chemical stabilization is a thing and it's a fine thing if that's the way you want to go i don't have any issues with that but we can't give you specifics on it because we don't do it right so we're not we're not not gonna be a lot of help right um but we do know enough that you need both of them and so yes. we've heard lots of people say oh i use this and this happens like, yeah well, you can't just add things. camden tablets you yeah. can't just add sorbet right. you actually need both of those right. things i don't know the ratios i don't know the amounts i just know that you do need both of those one of them prevents them from reproducing the other one prevents them from converting to alcohol i forget which is which and again like i said we don't really do that so not a thing for us but that is an option if that's the way you prefer to go so that leads us to our preferred method and that is pasteurization and we're going to get into detail on that particular topic later on on this particular talk yes but now let's talk about some things that people think are stabilizing that really aren't we already talked about one, and this, the stall is the first one. Sure that, sure, that a lot of people think is stable, but it's really not. The next one is cold crashing. Now, we have done a video on cold crashing, yep. and it was earlier in our career, and so I can't recall immediately what we may have said in there that have led people to believe that I don't think it's, it's just us. stabilization. I don't think it's just us. Okay. We're not the only people out there giving information on the internet about brewing. All Believe right. it or not, <laughs> there's yeah, others. I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I know. I'm just joking. So what is cold crashing, Brian? Cold crashing is when you take your brew and you drop its temperature down to just a few degrees above freezing. The idea is that as it gets cold, some of the solids can bind together and they can drop out of suspension. That's what cold crashing does. It does not stabilize your brew at all all. It actually just removes sediment and helps it to clear. You'll probably hear that we almost never cold crash for two reasons. One, it takes up a lot of space and we don't really have a lot of space to do it in. We don't have, you know, refrigerators just for that. Space. So, it's the final frontier. Yeah. It's a final frontier that just doesn't exist in this house. And two, that's all it really does is clear brews. It does it faster than if you did it 
over time. Or if you used, say, pectic enzyme, or if you used gelatin, or any, you know, some of the other things to clear. It's a little faster. Sometimes it can happen in a couple of days. I have heard of people cold crashing that took a month. So it's not necessarily always faster, but it is a way to do it. For difficult brews, a lot of people like to cold crash. Nothing wrong with doing it if you have the means, but remember one thing. It's still not stabilized. If there was sugars in there that can still ferment, they are going to, even in that temperature, okay? We know for a fact they can explode even in a refrigerator, it can still ferment. Right. Now, it does tend in most circumstances to slow down the fermentation process, oh, yeah. but that's just, it slows it down. It does not stop it. And if you think about particular brew styles, such as lagers, those are intended to be fermented in a colder climate. Right. So, not as cold as cold crashing, but still cold. Right, right. But there there are many different, there's wines, there's beers, there, sure. there's uh, lots of things yeah. that are designed to be fermented fermented in a colder climate. So those particular yeast strains that are developed to thrive in that environment, cold crashing is not going to slow them down at all. Well, it might still slow them versus a, low, a higher temperature, but it's not going to stop them. That's right. the key. It's right. not going to stop them. And the second part about cold crashing is this. You have your brew in there and it's all cold crashed and you think everything's great, but it was at, say, that 1.030 mark. And you pull it back out. You let it sit on the table for a while. Guess what? It could re it could start fermenting again because as the yeah. yeast heat back up to room temperature or, you know, anything above nearly freezing, they could restart again. And they very likely will. We hear it all the time. People are like, how come my brew stalled? Well, it happened to be the months between December and February. And every single time I say, so where do you keep it? Where are you keeping your fermenter? Oh, it's in a, in a side room or in the garage or on the floor in the wintertime. That, that floor is where all the cold air is going to collect. And that floor is just going to transfer all that cold temperature right into the fermenter, chilling it down. As soon as they warmed up by 5 to 10 degrees, 90% of the time, they started fermenting again. So cold crashing does not stop fermentation it's not a stabilizing stabilizing method yeah there you i go. can speak holy <laughs> crap all right so that's going to move us forward to the next topic which is fortification and this is another if then maybe sort of clause yes when it comes to stabilization and by fortification what i'm meaning is you're taking your homebrew and then you're adding a distilled spirit or just a stronger spirit or stronger spirit some people fortify with wine yeah I think you can even. fortify with wine um if it's stronger but typically it's a distilled spirit that's why usually that uh and you're, you're adding to that. So you're you're taking the ABV that you brewed and you're adding a stronger ABV to that to fortify the beverage. There's many uh, different commercial products that are by design fortified, such as... Port wine. Right. Uh, there's more. There's a lot more. That's just the first one that comes to mind. <laughs> um, actually, Dansk Mjod uh, Meadery fortifies most, if not all of their meats. Right. I don't know if they right. do all of them, but I know they they do. Like their Viking blood is actually yep. a fortified meat. Right. Uh, lots of, um, we have quite a few recipes that include fortification and we like actually- 30% really, mead. We really enjoy the process and we really enjoy uh, what it brings to the final product. So it's not only- raising your ABV, but it's also it's adding flavor flavors that otherwise you couldn't create on your own. Right. So what fortification can do to possibly stabilize your brew is if you get the math right and you go past your alcohol tolerance of your yeast, they're going to be overwhelmed and say, whoa, there's way too much alcohol here. I'm done. Right. But notice I prefaced that with, if you got your math right. Yeah. You have to be careful because you're changing the volumes and you are adding things together. So, for example, if you had uh, a 10% mead and you had a 50% neutral spirit, you can use math, and we have it in a couple of videos. We can actually put the formula in the description of this, I think, to uh, how to do it. I just do it in parts. It's a very simple thing. There's a couple of calculators online, too, um, that'll help you calculate it. But if I needed it to be 15%, I would add a certain amount of that 50% to it and eventually get it to 15%. Now, you have this interesting thing that starts to happen is if you only add a little bit, like... 
15% or 20% of the stilled spirit to your brew, it probably won't change the flavor by very much. But once you start going past that, that's when it starts to alter the flavor. So you might want something very neutral, or you might want something very flavored to use that flavor to enhance the brew rather than just fortify. And that's what we've done with a couple of ours, the 30% meat in particular. We used uh, a dark rum to enhance the flavors. We and actually it, ended up using quite a few different oh, we things. Used to get dark to that, rum, that magic white 30. rum, and we used some Everclear too, <laughs> I just believe... to get it to thirty. That was more of a meme thing, but it was really, really good, and I keep oh, drinking it. It's by the way, delicious. Um, I think it was the pineapple habanero caps camel where we tried out different I spirits. I think we did. Yep. So I will make sure to link that in the description below, so that way you can see our process and how we chose which spirit to fortify that particular beverage with, where it would add the right flavor that we were looking for. We also have another one that um, you've only seen a very small tidbits of so far, and that's our holiday fruitcake mead oh. that's coming out at Christmas time. That one, let me just give you a little insider story on this one. This is a full-on mead made with spices. It's a methaglin. It's, it's made totally in my wheelhouse. It's a methaglin spiced up that we then fortified, and it's aging now. Yeah. Yeah. So that the reveal will come in December. We are when, super excited. Oh, yeah. Um, the tastings that we've done so far have been amazing. This this is, this is could be our first 12. I'm just, <laughs> just saying. Could be a 12. Don't know yet. But that one, we stabilized by fortifying it past the alcohol tolerance of the yeast. And if you don't know what the alcohol tolerance of your yeast is, I don't know why, but nobody puts it on the packets. It's not on the packaging. Google Foo is your friend. Yes. Just search for... Alcohol tolerance of specific yeast type. Yes. And you That's all you got to do. Specific. And you'll find it in like two seconds. Right. It comes up very, very easily. And every time we tell somebody tell people to use Google Foo, somebody says, well, I don't have access to the internet. And I always say, then how are you watching our videos? Anyway, so that's the easiest way to find out the tolerance of your yeast. And every yeast has a tolerance. The yeast that you won't find a tolerance for are like bread yeasts and fresh yeasts and things like that. Just assume in all those cases, 12 to 13 percent. Just if you go with that, you'll never really go wrong, okay? Because they're rarely going to go much higher than that. But you also have to remember the one basic rule about yeast, which I always say is yeast, yeast can't, can't read. read. And what I mean by that is the yeast have no idea what is what the Google told them. They have no idea that they were made to do this specific thing. They don't know that our evil overlords that are making me evil. We're not evil. They don't know that their overlords making mead using them expect them to do a certain thing. They just know, ooh, sugar, me make CO2 and ethanol and other things. And I don't know why I went all caveman, but <laughs> that's all they know. So they're, they're, you know, they're microscopic organisms. They don't know anything. But so with that in mind, yeah, that was just crazy. When you're fortifying, I would suggest instead of going just past the yeast alcohol tolerance, Hi, Gizmo. Go farther. Go go as far Two, as Two, three points at least. Heart's content. Yeah. In other words, if your yeast alcohol tolerance is 15%, I would go to 17 or 18 just to be on the safe side. And even after I do that, I would still leave it under airlock for another week or two and take readings just to make sure. I Gizmo, you have to stop. We're live, babe. Go away. Sorry, this cats is, are getting needy. This is unedited, no cuts. and Well, minimal cuts. Fun. There are occasional cuts. <laughs> that one I might have to cut, but who knows? All right. Um, but that's, that is the gist of that. You want to make sure that you go enough above that, that margin of error doesn't become a problem. Yeah. And by leaving it under airlock for a little while, you just gave yourself a guarantee. I know I harp about taking readings all the time. And every once in a while, somebody will say, oh, I've been brewing for 30 years. I never take a reading and it's been just fine. I'm okay. sure it has, but there's that one time where it's not. But even still, that's not good advice for somebody that's just getting into it now. I would rather know for sure that my brew is in a range that's good for my yeast and that it's completely done and stable and ready and safe to be bottled versus taking a risk. Because here's the thing, hydrometers like 12 bucks. I mean, for $12, you just use that and you know for sure 
There's another reason why we keep harping about taking readings, and that's because with that information that you can give to us, then we are better equipped to help you. Yes. So the more you tell us in a question, the more we can help. Yeah. I don't know how many times, and I'm not really complaining because we love getting the comments and questions on the channel. We, we really do. I love that people trust us enough and give us that in, entrusting, entrustment, I don't know what the word is, to be the person that they want to ask that question of because they felt that we could help them. But so many times somebody says, I made a mead. It started three weeks ago and it doesn't look like there's any activity. What should I do? Should I add more yeast? I'm not even joking. That's actually a question that has come up more than once. And that's a perfectly fine question as long as we have all the information so that way we can actually right. answer it correctly. Because without knowing what your recipe is, what your volumes are, what yeast you use, what your environment is, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth, right. we can't give you a really good answer to that question. The best answer to the question, the way it's asked is, it depends. Because there's so many variables that could change that. It could be done. It could have stalled. We have no way of knowing based on the information given. So if you want us to be able to really help without me having to say, hey, how about this? Or hey, can you give me this? Or hey, what's this? When you ask a question, just say, I made this and give me your recipe and say, it's been this many days, your original gravity reading and your current gravity reading. Have you taken more than one gravity reading? Is it stable? Like, has it stabilized the gravity? Then we can help you. Without that, we can't. And half the time, if you actually take the time to do all of that, you're probably going to answer your own question before you even have to ask. Because a lot of the time, it becomes very obvious that, oh, yeah, this is done. <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of people that say, so it was bubbling really vigorously for like four days, and now there's nothing. Have you taken a reading? No. They take a reading, and it's finished. <laughs> it's at 1.000 or below. Yay, it worked perfectly. We have actually had people say that they dumped it out and then asked us what they did wrong so they don't do it next time. I'm like, you did nothing wrong except for dumping it out. <laughs> All right, so that leads us off of that tangent and back on track to- This is all about the tangents. The pasteurization. Unpasteurized, pasteurization on unpasteurized. <laughs> so when should you pasteurize? What is the criteria where you would need to pasteurize? What situation? The situation A would be I allowed my brew to go to dry and then I tasted it and I decided I didn't like it dry and I wanted it to be sweeter. And so I put some fermentable sugar in there because I wanted that particular sweetness profile added to my brew. I'm perfectly happy with the flavor of it now, but I don't want it to ferment it further and I haven't reached my yeast alcohol tolerance. I'm going to pasteurize. That sound you're hearing is more coffee mel being poured into my mug. Um, but yeah, she's absolutely right. That is when you would pasteurize. Basically, anytime there's a chance that it could reform it. It's that simple. When would you not need to pasteurize? If my beverage went completely dry and I decided I wanted it to be sweeter and I added unfermentable sugars, or my beverage went completely dry and I decided it was perfect and I wanted to keep it perfectly dry. Or if I did some funky math and I overextended my alcohol tolerance on my yeast and still had residual sweetness, but I let it sit longer than anticipated just to be sure, super, super, double, triple sure that it wasn't going to ferment anymore. And then I wouldn't have to pasteurize. Or if you fortified. Or if I fortified. Yep. That's, that was a really good answer, though. That was like everything all in one. Um, so, yeah, that's the gist. And pasteurization, we get this question a lot. We have a latest video on pasteurization where I use an immersion circulator, also known as sous vide. That's a method, not a device, by the way. And we do it in the whole fermenter. This has become my preferred way of doing it. Why, a, why is it your preferred method? Because of consistency, you can set an exact temperature so it doesn't go too hot and it doesn't get, it doesn't stay cold. And the open fermenter, we actually just leave the airlocks on them now, uh, pre prevents gas buildup. So we don't have a pressure problem. It's not going to blow up that bottle because of pressure. Now you want to check your fermenters. If you have cracks or anything like that in them, probably not going to be the fermenter you want to use to do this because it's going to break and it's probably not going to be uh, a good thing because you're going to lose everything. Okay. It's going to be gone. 
The final thing I want to add that Brian was probably getting to and hadn't gotten there yet is that the pasteurization process, particularly we found if you do it to a mead, is going to realign the proteins within the beverage and cause more sediment to fall out. Yeah. So doing it in the full gallon, you can then let it sit after it's pasteurized, clear even further, and then you would have a more clear end product once right. you go to bottle. It does actually help with clarity quite a bit. We found that it alters the flavor very slightly. And it alters it usually in a positive way. It doesn't actually negatively affect the flavor. It right. tends to make it a little more mellowed, kind of almost like, I call it faux aging sometimes. Yeah, it's a similar in effect to what an aged brew tastes like. Yeah, just a few so, months. Obviously, it's not aging because aging takes time. That's the only way you can age something. Right. But the the taste difference between a fresh brew and an aged brew is similar to an unpasteurized brew versus a pasteurized brew. Yes, that. Okay. Some other things about pasteurization that we want to talk about. We have a new version of ginger beer coming uh, because back in the day, we did a very convoluted way of making that beverage safe to store. And it was kind of weird because I always felt a little strange about it. And it was just kind of a, a feel and touch kind of thing. And you just kind of go with instinct. Essentially, what we did is we added more sugars than were needed for priming because there was just more sugars left in it. And we hoped to carbonate and then pasteurize with the carbonation still in there. But if you left it go a couple days too long, it could blow up. If you did it too soon, if you pasteurized too soon, then you didn't get any carbonation. So there was very much a Goldilocks effect on that one. Yeah. And what he's talking about, I'm going to say the same thing again, just in a different fashion, because that's how we work, is it's <laughs> it's the Goldilocks beverage. It's, it's a particular style of beverage that you're looking for that can be the most problematic. And that is an alcoholic beverage that is sweet and that is carbonated. Naturally carbonated. Those three things can cause the perfect storm. And it's very difficult to, in a homebrew situation, make sure that that brew has those three things and is still stabilized. Right. So we are working on more sound methods that are more easily replicable yes. without the guesswork. That are also safe because I just feel like that old method to somebody who's brewed before and has experience, it, it makes perfect sense and they can do it, no problem. But the outright beginner trying to make that I it could be a little bit um, dangerous. We do talk about it in the video, but we felt, you know, let's make something new that uses a better method. And that brings us to uh, ways of pasteurization. Again, I don't really like to pasteurize in the bottle because it can build up that pressure. Now, that means you don't ever want to carbonate something that's going to be pasteurized. Exactly. That's the point. So if you have to pasteurize something, try to use a non-fermentable sweetener if you want to have a carbonated beverage. Yeah. That's that's the safest method other than keg uh Keg, bleh, yeah, I can speak. Other than keg carbonation or pressure carbing, that's what I was trying to say is pressure carb. Yeah. If you pressure carb, then you can totally have a pasteurized brew that you pressure carb, and then it's all good. And that is something we are working on. I have the little one liter or one gallon pressure keg, and I just keep getting the wrong air things yeah, it for it. Yeah, didn't come with cartridges, and so we weren't getting food safe cartridges. <laughs> you know, and this is, this is some of the stuff that happens behind the scenes <laughs> that you guys don't even know about, you know? that it's like, seriously, I got the wrong ones again. They didn't say they weren't food safe. And then you read them and this is mm -hmm. not food safe. Oh, great. Thanks. You know? So that's one of the things that we are working on. And um, it should be coming, I don't know, sometime in the next few months, once we get a chance to actually work on that and get it to work right. I tried doing it on just plain old water, even using the, the non-food safe ones. And I still actually couldn't get carbonated water. So that kind of made me put it away for a little while, work on other things. And then we're going to Circle back. We'll we have get stuff back to, to do, people. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty much it for stabilization. If anybody has any questions about any of the stuff that we talked about here today, please ask in the comment section below. We'll, we're happy to help. This is what we're here for. This is what our channel is all about, it is trying to help you to be able to brew at home and do it simply, easily, and above all, safely. safely. So as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and listening. 
and have a great day. Bye-bye.